Hello friends, welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook, and today we are going to talk about God's imputed righteousness. God's imputed righteousness. Uh, this is something that I had mentioned a few days ago in a lesson that I had recorded, and I thought I would take the time to go ahead and develop this uh, particular biblical teaching. And this is a very important uh, Bible teaching, by the way. Um, and uh, I'm going to be reading primarily from the New American Standard Bible. The 1995 update version is the translation that I generally use. Uh, and I will provide a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to this article. This is actually a modified excerpt of my doctoral dissertation, which I completed back in uh, June of 2017. And my doctoral dissertation was on God's attribute of righteousness. So this was a subject that I had to address in the dissertation. So again, I, I lifted this out and then work through this for some time. So it's a modified excerpt, a um, little easier to read, I think. Um, but let me go ahead and jump into this. And I want to read uh, the first two verses in Romans chapter 4, which begins the introduction here. Paul says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? That Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness." Now, James, excuse me, Paul here is talking about being justified before God, and the argument is that he's going to be justified not by works, but by faith alone. Now, James addresses the issue of justification by faith or works, but his justification doesn't have to do with being justified before God. It has to, be, it has to do with being justified in the sight of other people. Because James raises the question, if someone may say, or someone may say, but the someone there is another person, not God. Someone may say, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Because in the eyes of other people, uh, our faith is justified in their sight when they see it in action. But before God's uh, sight, uh, no works are required. Nothing is needed uh, to justify us before God other than faith alone in Christ alone. And so let me go back to Romans 4, 3 through 5 here. For what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, Paul here is citing from uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Genesis 15, 6. And he goes on to say here in Romans 4, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. Now, Paul here is using a simple uh, analogy. He's talking about those who work a job and get a paycheck. So let me read it this way. Now, to the one who works a 40-hour work week, his wage or his paycheck is not credited as a gift, but as what is due. In other words, when you get your paycheck, it's not a gift. Your employer isn't being nice to you. They're paying you what is due to you. But he goes on, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, like most people in the world, I work for a living. I work for an agency that agrees to compensate me for my labor. Each day I work, I put the agency into debt. The agency relieves its debt every two weeks when it deposits money into my checking account. And for a brief moment, my employer owes me nothing. However, when I go back to work, I put the agency back into debt and we repeat the process. Now, in this arrangement, my paycheck is never considered as a favor, but as what is due. I do the work and my employer pays me. That's it. There's no grace between us. My paycheck is never considered a gift, but what is owed to me. Sadly, many people apply this same way of thinking to their relationship with God. The assumption is that if they do good works, 
God will compensate them with salvation. And as long as they continue to do good works, he keeps them saved. This is a works salvation. There is no grace here, only the repetition of work, work, and more work. And if they stop working, well, then the pay ceases. There's no more salvation, only the fearful expectation of judgment. And I'll be honest, about 30 years ago, when I was uh, much younger in my faith and in my understanding of God and His Word, uh, I thought this. I thought I could lose my salvation. Now, there are some people who think they bring works uh, initially uh, to faith in Christ, so it's Christ plus my works, and that together gets me saved, and then works keep me saved. Um, and God has a role to play in that as long as I keep doing good, but it's always that condition of good. But I was among those who thought, okay, well, God saves me by grace through faith, but once I'm in, now I must do something to keep myself saved. And I believe that I could forfeit my salvation. Some people say lose your salvation. I don't like that term. Uh, I lose my car keys. That's uh, accidental. I like the word forfeit because it implies more intentionality. But I believe that I could forfeit my salvation many years ago, which is just a backdoor form of works is all it is. Because if I can do something to unsave myself, then logically I'm doing something to keep myself saved or to earn my salvation. So in the end, it becomes a works salvation. But what I'm going to be arguing through here, and I'll be citing a number of scripture several times over to drive my point, is that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that good works should follow salvation, but they are never the condition of it. They should follow salvation, but they are never the condition of it. And God, once we are saved, then God calls us to a life of righteousness. He calls us to a life of holiness. He calls us to a life of good works. He calls us to a life of advancing to spiritual maturity by learning and living his word. And this is a constant daily thing. And God wants us to grow up. He wants us to be good sons and good daughters who represent him well in this world. And there's much good works that should follow salvation. And this is the life of a disciple. Uh, is what we're called to. But again, that is something that should follow salvation, but is never a condition of it. Now, the good news, according to Scripture, is that God reveals, is that God offers salvation not by good works, but by grace. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace, and the word grace here is the Greek word kodos, and it means undeserved kindness or undeserved favor or unearned favor. It means you don't deserve it. You don't earn it. It's not a matter of how good you are. In fact, God justifies the ungodly, not the good person, not the moral person, the ungodly person. But he's quite clear here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, faith does not save. Christ saves. Faith is merely the instrument by which you receive that salvation. So you are saved by grace uh, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Now listen, when somebody gives a gift, if I give a gift to somebody, it means I paid for it in full, and I give it to them without charge. That's what makes it a gift. If I require somebody to pay for something, it's not a gift. It means they bought it. And that's true for our salvation. If we have to do works, then it means we bought it. It's not a gift at that point, okay? But he's very clear here that it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, again, good works should follow salvation. You think of Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so that is phase two of the Christian life. So we go from being justified to a life of sanctification in which we are growing in righteousness and holiness to the Lord. Titus 3.5 says that he saved us, and that's always the order. It's God saves us. We don't save ourselves. We don't participate. He saved us. Again, notice Paul's emphasis here. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now, the amazing truth of Scripture is that the one who does not work 
but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, did you catch that? Don't miss it. God gives something to the one who does not work. Do you want what God has for you? (laughs) Then stop trying to work for it. It's a gift, freely given and freely received. And how is it received? By faith. We simply trust God at his word. We believe God when he tells us that our salvation was accomplished in Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and raised again on the, th- <coughs> excuse me, on the third day. Uh, Paul, when giving, explaining the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. And the idea there in saying that Christ died for our sins is the idea of substitution, that he died as a substitute for us. So he died for our sins, and this according to the uh, reliable, accurate record of the scriptures, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared before many, that he ascended into heaven. But the question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that Christ died for you, that he was buried and raised again on the third day? I do. I believe the biblical record to be accurate, a reliable report concerning the person and work of Christ and really everything that the Bible touches on from creation onward. I take it in just a very plain reading, a literal reading of the text, uh, unless there's something in there that tells me to read it. Otherwise, I take it in a very straightforward way. Um, So again, we believe God when he tells us that our salvation was accomplished in Christ, who died for our sins, was buried and raised again on the third day. And who receives it? Not the good person, but the ungodly, the one who deserves it the least. That's me, that's you. And what is it that's given? What is credited to our account? Righteousness. God's own righteousness is given to the ungodly person who does not work for it, but believes in him. Now that is grace. And I am a grace man. I believe in grace, uh, salvation by grace, a life by grace. Uh, I'm very much a grace man. Um, But I get this from the word of God because God has been very gracious to me, tremendously gracious to me. Now, some might raise the question, and rightly so, how can a holy God justify unworthy sinners? How can he give something to someone who deserves the opposite? How is this just? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. The answer is found in Jesus and what he accomplished for us at the cross. At the cross, God judged our sin as his righteousness requires and saves the sinner as his love desires. Both are true. You see, at the cross, uh, we see intersecting attributes of God, and God has many attributes. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, righteous, just, holy, immutable, uh, truthful, sovereign, gracious, merciful, kind, patient, good, and, and other attributes. But God has many attributes. But at the cross, I believe the attributes of righteousness and love uh, coalesce. They come together. And so at the cross, it really is a place of judgment, and we should see it as that. I'm going to argue for that here in a moment. But it is also a, a place where God demonstrates his love, and both are going on at the same time. So at the cross, God judged our sin as his righteousness requires and saves the sinner as his love desires. At the cross, Jesus voluntarily died a penal substitutionary death. A penal death, he bore the penalty for our sins. Substitution, that is, he died in our place, and he bore the penalty, the punishment, which was death. So at the cross, Jesus voluntarily died a penal substitutionary death. He willingly died in our place and bore the punishment that was rightfully ours. Our guilt became his guilt. Our shame became his shame. The result of the cross is that God is forever satisfied with the death of Christ. There's no additional sacrifice or payment needed. Jesus paid it all. When we believe in Jesus, we are forgiven all of our sins. 
And then God imputes his righteousness to us. He imputes his righteousness to us. Now, the Apostle Paul in Romans 5.17 calls it the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says that he made him, that is God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Paul said that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So God's righteousness is not earned. Rather, it is freely gifted to us who believe in Jesus as our Savior. Now, biblically, I want to take a moment to talk about three important imputations. Oh, I think there are others, but I think that there are biblically that there are three major imputations that relate to our standing before God. First is the imputation of Adam's original sin to every member of the human race. The imputation, that is, Adam, when he committed his sin in the garden in which he ate the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when he committed that sin, when he died, we died with him because he is the progenitor. He represents the human race. And this is why Paul says in Romans 5, 12, where he says, therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And when did we all sin? We sinned when Adam sinned. And 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For since by a man, that's Adam, came death, by a man, that's Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And if you can visualize for a moment two lines of humanity standing before God, and at the head of each line are two persons. One is Adam and the other is Christ. And either you are in one line or you are in the other. And that's almost what Paul is is, is presenting here, this, this visual, if you can think of this. And so if you are in the line of Adam, then for you there is death. Spiritual death, and death, by the way, does not mean cessation of life. It means separation. Biblically speaking, it means separation. And this is separation from God in time. Uh, This is spiritual death. The second death described in Revelation is the separation of God for eternity. Uh, When we die physically, it's the separation of uh, of the soul from the body. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, And the body shall return to the dust, and the the soul shall return to God, or the spirit shall return to God who gave it. And it's that separation. Now, resurrection is the undoing of that. It's the bringing back together of soul and body. Uh, But nonetheless, the first imputation is that of Adam's original sin to every member of the human race. Now, every biological descendant of Adam is charged or credited with the sin that he committed in the Garden of Eden, which plunged the human race into spiritual and physical death. Now, Jesus is the only exception. He's the only exception. For though he is truly human, and he is that, he is truly human, and you read like in, uh, in uh, uh, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is a biological descendant um, uh, that goes from Abraham uh, down through David and uh, all the way through the line of Mary. Uh, and through uh, Mary through the biological line, Joseph through the legal line. Uh, And he's also descended back to Adam. Luke records him going all the way back to Adam. But Jesus was born without original sin. He was born without a sin nature, and he committed no sin during his time on earth. And by the way, Mary, when she was a virgin, God the Holy Spirit supernaturally impregnated her, put a seed within her uh, that was not uh, from uh, Joseph, Now, Mary had other children by Joseph, and they were little sinners because the sin nature is passed on genetically from the man to the woman, 
uh, or from the man to the child. And so God could produce a, a true human being uh, that is the God-man, the theanthropic person, when God the Son added humanity to himself. And this took place at the virgin conception, at the virgin conception, in which Mary was supernaturally impregnated. Uh, and so she could conceive in her womb a person who was without original sin, without a sin nature. And then when he was born, he came into the world, and in the Greek we call this parthenogenesis, virgin conception, virgin born. And by the way, Mary was the mother of his humanity, not his deity. She was Christotakos, a bearer of Christ, but she was not Theotakos, the mother of God. God doesn't have a mother, but she was the mother of the humanity of Christ. And so she gives birth to Jesus, and throughout his life, he committed no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin. 1 Peter 2.22 says, who committed no sin. And 1 John 3.5 says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Hebrews 4.15, we could add to this, that says that he was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life. He's the only person in the history of the human race ever to live a perfectly righteous righteous life. He he completely executed the Father's will uh, in thought, in word, in action, in everything he said and everything he did. It was perfect, okay? And so he went through his entire life and committed no sin. Now Jesus is going to go to the cross and he's going to die, but not for his sin because he was guilty of none, okay? Now Adam is the head of the human race and his and his fall became our fall. This is the basis for death and for being estranged from God. Adam's The imputation of Adam's original sin uh, is a very important biblical doctrine. Now, the second imputation that is important with regard to our standing before God is the imputation of all sin to Jesus on the cross. So the first imputation is Adam's sin to all of humanity minus Jesus. The second imputation is all sin that is imputed to Jesus while he is on the cross. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.21, going back to that, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Hebrews 2.9 says that, but we do, say, we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned him, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And 1 John 2.2 2 says that he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And so our sins were imputed to Christ. They were imputed to Christ on the cross. And God the Father judged Jesus in our place. He judged him in our place. Mark 10.45 says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all. It was a one-and-done deal, okay? Uh, so he died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. To what end, Peter says? So that he might bring us to God, uh, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So, again, the second is the imputation of all sin to Jesus on the cross, and God the Father judged Jesus in our place, canceling our sin debt by the death of Christ. Canceling our sin debt by the death of Christ. We can't pay. We can produce sin. See, here's the problem. We can produce sin. We can't deal with the sin. That's the problem. Only God can deal with sin, and he dealt with it at the cross. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, it says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Notice verse 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he, that is God the Father, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So God takes our sin and imputes it to Christ, and Christ bore our sin on the cross. And by the way, this was a voluntary imputation on the part of Christ, 
who freely went to the cross and took our sins upon himself. Uh, Jesus was not forced to go to the cross. He willingly went. I love John 1.29, where John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is called the doctrine of expiation. Expiation, if you ever study theology, that's a word you will come across, is expiation. And the doctrine of expiation refers to the removal of sin. You see, if you go back and you study in the Old Testament, and you look at the sacrificial system, a word that you will see over and over and over again is the Hebrew verb kafar, the Hebrew verb kafar, and it means to cover. And in the Old Testament, when a sacrifice was given as an expression of faith, it was merely a covering for sin. It was a temporary arrangement uh, in which sin was covered until the time that Christ could come and actually take the sin away and actually remove it. And that's what the doctrine of expiation is. Now, Jesus says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 15, Jesus says, even as the Father knows me and I know know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In verse 17 and 18, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. And he's very clear, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So Jesus willingly went to the cross and laid down his life and died a penal substitutionary death. So we have the imputation of of Adam's original sin to all of humanity. All of humanity's sin imputed to Christ upon the cross. And the third imputation, and this is where it hits you and me, is the imputation of God's righteousness to those who believe in Jesus for salvation. That's the main thrust of this uh, presentation of this of this uh, article, and it's to emphasize or to drive the point that uh, we receive God's righteousness. That is, the very righteousness of God is gifted to us. It is credited to our account, and only to those who believe in Christ. Now, the righteousness of God. Uh, is imputed to the believer at the moment of faith in Christ, and this results in us being justified before God. And listen, when, when we talk about salvation, we should understand that salvation has different facets to it, different facets to it. Uh, and part of that is is subtraction, which is the removal of sin. So your sin is removed, and it is put upon Christ, and he's judged. By the way, it's all sin, past, present, and future, uh, because all sin for us was future at the time when Christ <clears throat> died upon the cross. Uh, But in the exchange, uh, all of our sin is placed upon him, but then his righteousness is given to us. It is credited to our account. And so we receive that, and we receive the gift of eternal life, and we receive a a spiritual gift, and we receive a portfolio of spiritual assets, Ephesians 1.3. We receive an identity in Christ, in Christo. Uh, We have a calling. We are children of God, brothers and sisters to the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are adopted into the family of God. We are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, We are uh, called to grow up. We are given the Word of God, which is our spiritual nourishment that helps our spiritual development. Listen, there's a lot of blessings in the Christian life, wonderful blessings. And it is wonderful to unpack these uh, through a a thorough study of the Word of God. And then to live that out in the Christian life, there is no better life to be lived. None. No better life. No higher calling. No more noble of a purpose to live than that which is lived in our relationship with God through Christ. So again, the righteousness of God uh, is imputed to the believer at the moment of faith in Christ, which results in the believer being justified before God. Romans 3.22 says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe. In verse 24, he says that we are justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 28, he says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith and not by 
the works of the law. Very clear, very clear. No ambiguity here. So now let's move into the meaning of imputation. The meaning of imputation. Now, the word imputation itself is actually an accounting term. It is actually an accounting term that is used both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Moses <clears throat> wrote of Abraham in Genesis 15, 6, saying, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And the word reckoned here is the word that is translated imputed. It's the Hebrew word kasav, kasav, and uh, uh, logizomai is the Septuagint a Greek reading. But here it says, then he believed in the Lord, that is Abraham believed in the Lord, and he, God, imputed or credited it to him as righteousness. And in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, David writes, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. But again, how blessed is the man uh, to whom the Lord does not impute. And there's our Hebrew word kasav again. Now, now, both Moses and David use the Hebrew word kasav, which means, in, which in context means to impute or to reckon to. To impute or to reckon to. And this uh, definition is taken from Hallett, from the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. Uh, now, Moses uses the verb in a positive sense of that which God imputes to Abraham, namely righteousness. And David uses the verb negatively of that which God does not credit to a person, namely iniquity. Dr. Alan P. Ross, who did the uh, t uh, the he, his, he wrote the Hebrew textbook that I used when I was uh, working on my Master of Divinity, and I used it into my doctoral program as well. He's written a three-volume commentary set on Psalms, and of course he's written on Genesis, uh, Creation and Blessing. I think it's probably the best commentary on Genesis I have ever seen, uh, highly recommended. But his three-volume set on the Psalms, Pure Gold. Pure gold. I love Dr. Ross. He's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant Hebrew scholar. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and I quote him here. So Dr. Alan Ross comments on the meaning of kasav in Psalm 32 and in Genesis 15, 6. He says, quote, Not only does forgiveness mean that God takes away the sins, but it also means that God does not impute iniquity to the penitent. Blessed is the one to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. The verb, kasav, means to impute, to reckon, or to credit. It is the language of records or accounting. In fact, in modern usage, the word is related to computer. Here, the psalm is using an implied comparison, as if there were record books in heaven that would record the sins. If the forgiven sins are not imputed, it means there is no record of them. They are gone and forgotten. Because God does not mark iniquities, there is great joy. The same verb is used in Genesis 15, 6 as well, which says that Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. The Apostle Paul brings that verse and Psalm 32, 2 together in Romans 4 to explain the meaning of justification by faith. When people believe in the Lord, God reckons or credits them with righteousness. Paul will say the righteousness of Jesus Christ and does not reckon their sin to them, end quote. Now, the Apostle Paul cites Abraham's faith in God as the basis upon which he was declared righteous before him. Again, citing Romans 4, 3, which says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the word credited here, or imputed, is the Greek uh, word logizomai. Logizomai. And by the way, when the uh, Old Testament, when the uh, Hebrew Old Testament was translating into Greek what's called the Septuagint, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, which was written about 250 BC, the translators of the Septuagint used logizomai as a reliable synonym for Kazav, both in Genesis uh, 15, 6 and Psalm 32, verse 2. 
Now, Paul used the Greek verb logizomai, which means... <coughs> Uh, which means to determine by mathematical process, to reckon, calculate frequently in a transferred sense, end quote. And that is taken from the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. Now, Abraham believed God at his word, and God reckoned or transferred his righteousness to him. After pointing to Abraham as the example of justification by faith, Paul then extrapolates that we are justified in the same way, saying, and here I'm quoting Romans 4, 4, and 5 again. See, I told you I'd repeat myself. In which Paul says here, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited, logizomai, as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited, logizomai, as righteousness. Paul then references David, saying, quote, David also speaks of the blessing of the man to whom God credits, logizomai, righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And the word account there is our Greek word logizomai. Now, in other places, Paul twice uses the Greek verb elogeo, elogeo, to communicate the idea of an exchange between persons. Uh, he uses that in Romans 5.13, as well as in Philemon 1.18. <coughs> Excuse me. The verb elegeo, according to um, the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament uh, and other early Christian literature, um, the, the verb elegeo means to charge with a financial obligation, charge to the account of someone. Now, it's interesting that Paul tells his friend Philemon, who had a runaway slave, and that's what the little letter of Philemon is about, uh, where this slave runs away from Philemon, his name is Onesimus, and he goes to Rome and he finds Paul, and Paul sends him back with this letter. <clears throat> And so he sends back this letter with Onesimus, and he tells his friend concerning this runaway slave. Notice what Paul says here in Philemon 1.18. If he, that is Onesimus, has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. That's very interesting. So he says of Onesimus, uh, that if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, in other words, Philemon, if, if Onesimus owes you anything, if, he's, if, he's, uh, if, he's, if there's anything that he needs to pay, then charge that to my account. Now, Paul himself had not been wronged by Philemon, nor does he owe Philemon anything. However, Paul was willing to pay for any wrong or debt Onesimus may have occurred. And Dr. Pentecost, who wrote this wonderful little book, Things Which Become Sound Doctrine, Things Which Become Sound Doctrine, very good book. I recommend this. If you don't have it on your library, get it. It's worth your time. Um, I'm quoting him here. He says, uh, quote, Paul is giving us an illustration of that which God has done for us in Christ Jesus. As the Apostle Paul assumed the debt of Onesimus and invited Philemon, who had, who had been wronged, uh, to charge that debt to him, so the Lord Jesus Christ took the debt that we owed to the injured one, that is to God, and he charged himself with our debt and set his righteousness down to our account, end quote. And that's where you see in that use of the language this idea of an exchange, of, uh, of an exchange going on there. Now, in a similar way, Jesus paid our sin so that we don't have to. He bore it upon the cross in full, and in exchange we receive God's righteousness. Now, this idea of an exchange between persons means that one person is credited, is credited with something not antecedently his or her own. In other words, our sin is our sin. And Christ's righteousness is his righteousness. That is something that is uh, true to us, okay, by way of experience. When Jesus took our sin upon himself at the cross, he, was volunt he voluntarily accepted something that belonged to another, 
namely us. Jesus took our sin upon himself. On the other hand, when we receive his righteousness as a gift, we are accepting something that belonged to another, namely Christ. It's his righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It's his righteousness, but it is being given to me as a gift. And when God looks down from heaven, he no longer sees you or any of your own righteousness. He sees his righteousness in you. And on that basis, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, Very important to understand. So Jesus' righteousness becomes our righteousness. Now, Paul references the exchange that occurred at the cross when Jesus died for our sin, saying, and here I'm citing 2 Corinthians 5.21 again, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And he personally spoke of the righteousness which is through faith in Christ. Here I'm citing from Philippians 3.9. Uh, the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God, from God, on the basis of faith. Now, once we receive God's righteousness, we are instantaneously justified in God's sight forever, forever. Now, Dr. McChesney, uh, and here I'm quoting uh, the definition of justification as set forth in the Unger's Bible Dictionary, which is a a very good dictionary. I recommend it. Uh, But Dr. McChesney states, quote, Justification is a divine act whereby an infinitely holy God judicially declares a believing sinner to be righteous and acceptable before him because Christ has borne the sinner's sin on the cross and has become to us righteousness. Justification, he goes on to say, justification springs from the fountain of God's grace. It is operative as the result of the redemptive and propitiatory sacrifice of Christ, who has settled all the claims of the law. Justification is on the basis of faith and not by human merit or works. In this marvelous operation of God, the infinitely holy judge judicially declares righteous the one who believes in Jesus. A justified believer emerges from God's great courtroom with a consciousness that another, his substitute, has borne his guilt and that he stands without accusation before God. Justification makes no one, makes no one righteous. Uh, that is in conduct, he goes on to say. He says, justification makes no one righteous, neither is it the bestowment of righteousness as such, but rather it declares one to be justified whom God sees as perfected once and forever in his beloved Son. So God doesn't make us righteous. The, the gift of righteousness doesn't make us righteous in conduct any more than our uh, sin being imputed to Christ made him a sinner. It didn't make him a sinner in conduct. In that sense, that, that, that idea is, is not to be uh, concluded. The imputation means that he took it upon himself and he bore the punishment for our sin. On the flip side, we receive the righteousness of God as a gift, but, it's, but it does not make us righteous. It opens the door for us to pursue a life of righteousness by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, by means of the crippling of the sin nature, uh, by means of learning and living God's Word. <clears throat> other passages address this. Romans 6, 11 through 14 addresses this and other passages as well. Now, it is sometimes difficult to accept this biblical teaching because our behavior does not always reflect our righteous standing before God. After all, even princes sometimes fail to live by the royal family honor code. However, God's word defines reality, and we are justified in his sight because of his righteousness, uh, which has been gifted to our account. The righteousness of God that is credited to us who have trusted in Jesus as our Savior. Well, I hope this lesson has been helpful to you. My voice is starting to fail, in case you can't tell. But I hope this lesson has been helpful to you. If you did enjoy this lesson, please uh, hit the like button below. 
And, uh, and if you do have questions or comments, I do respond to those, so please feel free to record any questions or comments. I will get back with you on that. And, uh, and if you enjoyed this lesson and would like to receive others like it, then be sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation, and I wish you a good day.